The July issue Adaptive Sports Recreation and Exercise features Amy Bockerstad, amateur golfer who has Down syndrome. Additional topics covered are traveling with an autistic child, helping reduce the summer slide of learning and self-advocating through speaking out. Read it today at www.epmagazine.com. Oscar Mike Radio is a proud podcast partner of Reads Across America Radio. Heard every Thursday at 11 a.m. and Sunday at 8 a.m. Eastern. They're also big supporters of the nonprofit I Got Your Six, Two Lives at Once. And with every wreath you sponsor through Oscar Mike Radio, $5 goes back to this great organization dedicated to making a difference in the lives of veterans, law enforcement, firefighters, and first responders battling PTSD. Two Lives at Once pairs these brave men and women together with dogs rescued from kill shelters. In this way, two lives are saved at the same time by saving each other. Donate now. Go to wreathsacrossamerica.org slash Oscar Mike Radio to help. That's wreathsacrossamerica.org slash Oscar Mike Radio. Suicide is preventable, and each of us has a role to play in suicide prevention. Suicide is complex. There is no single cause, and it's not always a mental health issue. It could be loss of a job or home, financial or relationship issues, pain, or leaving the military. Suicide does not discriminate. It affects all ages, races, and genders, veterans or not. If you know a veteran who is struggling, connect with them. Let them know help is available. There is quick and easy access to services in times of crisis. Dial 988, then press 1. Talking about it is okay. Don't keep it inside. Don't be ashamed. Don't wait. Reach out. Find resources at va.gov reach. Hello and welcome again to Oscar Mike Radio. My name is Travis. I'm Marine Corps veteran and your host. Oscar Mike Radio is part of the Hoobazoo Network. You can find out more on hoobazoo.com. I want to thank my sponsors, Joyce Asak of Asak Real Estate, Army National Guard veteran Mark Holmes of Reapers Detailing and Power Washing, and my supporters, Case on Shaving Company, Exceptional Parent Magazine, and Black Cat Designs. I love when I get to talk with people who maybe didn't serve or, you know, they're a civilian company. And what I mean by that is um, they don't really, you know, serve the military space strictly, but advocate for military families, veterans in their own way. And my next guest is no exception uh, from Elevate Health in New Jersey, Nicole Palmer. Welcome to Oscar Mike Radio. I'm looking so much to learning from you and having you share about the mission you all do. Thanks so much for having me, Travis. So as I understand it, we, we reached out, we got connected, I started learning. And one of the unique things in the area you're in is you all focus on speech pathology. Is that correct? Do I get that right? Yes. So we have speech pathology, audiology, and occupational therapy services at our clinic. So now I was an air wing Marine, but you know, I'm still a Marine. You got to break this down Barney style, as my sergeant used to say, <laughs> kind of educate me here on what, what encompasses speech pathology. So speech, 
speech pathology sometimes is a misnomer because people will say, oh, so you help kids with their R's, which is part of it, or, oh, you help people who stutter. That's absolutely part of it. Um, but we like to say that speech goes from birth to 100 and even beyond that. In terms of the lifespan, we work with very young children, adolescents, adults, geriatric patients, anywhere from their speech, which is the articulation, how things sound coming out of your mouth, the language, which is how everything in the brain creates communication, um, also swallowing, cognitive skills, voice, what's coming out of your throat. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to what we're expected to be the experts in. Really? So I was one of those laymen who thought it was just somebody sitting in a chair with a flashcards you know, kind of like the rain in Spain stays mainly on the plane kind of a deal, but more intense. That's what I thought it was. That's that's extremely interesting. So it, it's it's not any of that, or it's a very small part of that. Yeah, that would be a small part of it. I can say with absolute certainty in my eight years, I've never done that part. I usually don't use flashcards. <laughs> well, see, I, it just shows you how much I don't know, which is why we're here. So... The discipline, the practice of speech path, you know, pathology goes is I have to think that, you know, not everybody is the same. There are different, you know, things you got to work on. How does speech pathology assess somebody and say, you know what, this is what they need to improve or move their life for? Because I have to think not being able to speak is, is extremely frustrating at best. Yeah, absolutely. We talk a lot about the mental component that not having your voice, whether it's your true voice actually not coming out of your vocal cords correctly, or from your speech, or the words you have in your brain not coming out through your mouth, any of those things can have a huge impact psychologically. So we really talk about the brain-body connection when it comes to how it informs how we live our lives. So just like you mentioned, uh, seeing a patient for a stroke evaluation versus seeing a three-year-old who's having delayed talking those are going to be different specialties or different areas of competence for the speech pathologist, but it all comes down to still treating the patient and their family with dignity and making sure that above all else, we're trying to help that quality of life and make sure that they have a voice. So you and I and everybody in the world has, I wouldn't say a pick, but a lot of options for career paths, uh, career journeys and, and professional aspirations. What was the the driver, the calling, the catalyst for you to say, Nicole, you know what? This is something that I'm really interested in doing because as I understand it, speech pathology, like any medical practice, is is a lot of having to really pour yourself into the patient's needs and trying to get them to, for lack of a better term, heal themselves. So what what drew you to this practice? So I really knew nothing about speech pathology when I went into it. Um, I started as a linguistics major, which is very research-based. And as I got more into that field, I realized that there aren't very practical applications. And sorry to any linguists out there who are doing practical application. But from my understanding, it was very theory and research-driven, which was cool and interesting. But I have always been someone that's been involved with other people and wanting to work with other people. I did a lot of teaching. Um, music when I was younger. And that is something that I have used to incorporate in my speech pra practice um, in how I teach and how I educate others. So actually one of the prerequisites for linguistics um, for another course was intro to speech and hearing science. And I thought, okay, that's fine. Um, and then it started talking about everything a speech pathologist could do. And I was always very worried about becoming complacent or not pushing myself, not learning more, finding one job and sticking with it seemed kind of boring for the rest of my life. So when I learned that I could work with preschoolers, I could work with teenagers, I could work with adults, I could work in the hospital, I could work in the schools, I could go out in the field, anything like that is really what drew me to it, what, what was super interesting to me. Um, and it was just kind of found the right spot from there. Now you start this and part of your, your training or your, your, journey took you through the VA system. And a lot of people, and in, in even me, who's a part of the VA system is still 
it's still kind of strange to me how that all works. It's a very convoluted, interconnected system. But kind of take us through what that was like, please. Absolutely. So I was fortunate enough as a graduate student to have a placement at the VA hospital in Dallas. And that was my first introduction to how speech pathology works in the medical system and seeing how huge the VA is on a, a national, international scale. Um, so that was what initially drew me from my experience with my father being a veteran um, to being interested in working with that population specifically and seeing that all of the things that we learn in speech pathology are applicable to veterans from either developmental issues that someone may have had that they carried with them through their whole lives or things that happened to them in the service that now they're receiving these speech services for. Um, then as I applied for my clinical fellowship, I was again fortunate enough to be accepted at the San Antonio VA Medical Center um, where I worked for the next seven years. And that was where I would have assumed I would have stayed the rest of my life if life hadn't taken me uh, back home to New Jersey. But it was uh, truly the fundamental experience of my career and really what has taught me how to interact with people, how to care for the whole person, um, how to consider all the aspects of someone's interpersonal connections and their support systems and how that's gonna affect how they are able to deal with whatever illness or disease or diagnosis they're dealing with now. So we're gonna go with this kind of, you know, tongue in cheek and then a little serious, but us veterans can be, you know, a different breed to work with, right, Nicole? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I mean, right. I mean, you know, we're, we're not like everybody else. How, how are we different from, I wouldn't say the average civilian, but for a civilian, how are we different? Because, you know, I, I go to PT and I'm told all the time, like we're, we're, we're a different kind of, kind of problem to solve. And it's, it takes a special practitioner to work at the VA also <laughs> to work at the VA and, and stay at the VA. But, um, for the first thing, everyone has been in the service, right? So everyone has had that level of, regardless of what service you were in, you had, you went through basic, you went through maybe some deployment situations, you've traveled likely. Um, generally, most veterans are gonna have some element of, of PTSD or something like that that's going to also impact how their other diagnoses are treated. Um, those are some of the more serious things, but you know, funny wise, I can usually be a little bit more um, down to earth and I mean, I'm not crass, but I have a good relationship with veterans and they can say whatever they want to me and I can give it right back. So that was always well, that's a, a kind of expected. Part. Like if, if we if you're a pushover, we're like, you're no fun. But if you can give yeah. it right back, we're like, OK, you know, she's all right. You know, she's yeah. all right. You know, we, we have to have yeah. that. But, you know, just to go serious, though. Um, you know, I served with guys who couldn't really talk. And the, the problem was when they went to become like NCOs or even some of the officers who had, whether it was, you know, just public speaking anxiety or other kinds of physiological or psychological issues, they, they didn't move the way they could have moved if they had been able to speak. So there was a level of of me versus them and frustration that you just i didn't know how to get through right i mean did you ever see that in the community you know that you served in so with the veteran population yeah. not as much because everyone was discharged at that point but now that i'm working more with active duty members i do see that that's usually why speech services are sought out for either stuttering or an issue with the voice itself which could be from stress strain in the vocal cords um a pathological issue with a tumor or something like that that has happened um, to prevent, you know, as strong of a voice as you would want, especially with commanding and being authoritative. So usually when I'm working with active duty members, it tends to be more of the voice or stuttering issues. And just like you said, feeling like it's preventing them from achieving that next level or that others are or they're feeling like they're undermined because of what their voice sounds like. You do your time at the VA, and then you said life moved you back to New Jersey, um, going from San Antonio to New Jersey area must have been a, a change again in life. But you, you started working for Elevate Health in New Jersey. Now, how did that come to be? So 
So one of my specialty areas is called augmentative alternative communication, and the short sweet term is AAC. And what that means is, again, across the lifespan, there are going to be issues that prevent people from physically being able to use their mouth to create words, to create sounds. So AAC is something like my phone or an iPad or something else that you can either touch buttons or I worked, one of my primary jobs at the VA was working with veterans with ALS and we used eye gaze so that they, even though they lose their ability to function with other parts of their bodies, the eyes stay pretty consistent. So they're able to move their eyes to communicate through these boards that are digital and can produce speech. Um, so when I was looking for a new job and I was, you know, I was on the back burner for looking at some other VAs in the area, but as far as travel went, I really wanted to stay close in South Jersey. And I found Elevate was asking for an AAC specialist looking for AAC specifically. And I thought, well, that's strange. That's very specific. Um, and then as I interviewed with Elevate and talked more with Dr. Davies, uh, the owner, I realized how big AAC is in this area, um, definitely with some adults, but specifically with children. And that was an uh, area I had not really had experience in yet with the being at the VA for so long. Um, so that's really what drew me to Elevate and to expanding my horizons. Again, finding something that was a, a little bit the same, but a lot different and continuing to learn and grow. We talked about this briefly in our communication before we, we were on now about the fact that you're in a position where you are located in New Jersey to serve military families and to your point earlier active duty families but i'm really curious for military families what what are the challenges that military families face versus a civilian family because it's it's not quite the same getting the care you need for your child as a, a military family that could be moving in six months versus a civilian i just wonder if you kind of unpack that for me please Absolutely. So just like you said, that inconsistency at times of, you know, not knowing where you might be in six months to a year for the parent, obviously, that's still going to be difficult. But for the child, that may be incredibly hard to get used to and be OK with this constant change. Um, I was lucky enough as a child that my dad was in the reserves for the most part, and he would go off where he needed to go. And we stayed pretty much in the same place in South Jersey. Um, so for children who maybe they're able to stay in the spot and their parent leaves, that's another element of how do we process that between three and six years old. That's a, a tough thing when your parent is gone for an extended period of time and you're dealing with something like a speech disorder, like a language disorder, and maybe grandma stepping in and bringing you to and from appointments. How are we still communicating and making sure mom and dad know what's going on, how to help their child even when they're deployed or, or off? at a different location. Um, so again, it's that holistic care as opposed to we're not just treating the speech or the language disorder, we're really focusing on how are we helping the whole family through this while they have these external factors brought on by their service to their country that are making it more challenging. So where, where did that awareness for your care protocol come from? Because not every civilian care provider is going to understand what military families go through. So it seems very interesting to me, uh, you know, before we talked and right now that that's coming from somewhere. You're understanding what the military families face. You have care guidelines to meet that need and you're meeting that need. I'm just curious, how did that come to be, please? So for myself personally, uh, my dad was in the Air Force uh, for 20 years. He was a KC-10 uh, refueler. No so he was in, yeah, yeah, he was out of McGuire Air Force Base. Um, he was in Desert Storm. He was in uh, OIF. And um, he also did, again, reserve duty. So he would be out at um, Hickam Air Force Base in, in Honolulu for weeks at a time. Uh, he was stationed out in um, Ramstein in Germany uh, for months at a time. So really just kind of depended on where the job took him. But the, the main thing I recall from those times um, is number one, being proud, being proud of my dad and what he was doing, how he was helping others, um, you know, at the cost to himself and maybe to us. But the other thing I remember is um, when uh, the Iraq war started and, you know, we would celebrate every time a plane came back with soldiers. 
um, there was a party, there was a celebration for the families at the base. As the months and the years progressed, that started to be less and less. Um, and something that my dad really spearheaded was continuing to have little celebrations when planes came home. Um, pizza parties, bringing flowers for the wives and husbands that were, were celebrating their loved one coming home. Um, he made sure that those families weren't forgotten, especially as it became, unfortunately, more of a day-to-day -day normal situation to be in a, a war, right? So that was something that I looked at and thought, that's amazing that he can have that capacity to care for others. And I guess not consciously until I was older did I really realize the impact it had on me. Okay. What about professionally? I mean, you know, you're in an area where you're near, Elevate Health is in an area, right? Where they're near an Air, Air, Air Force base and other military installations. So did did this focus on that kind of care was it purpose driven or was there a story behind that so um dr davies christy davies who's the owner of elevate is also a military spouse so her husband was also in the air force and we actually found out later that um my dad and her husband must have just missed each other in uh, the squadron so i was i was texting my dad did you know glenn davies did you know blah 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 and like trying to go back and forth with these different people and he you know thinks he's an old man now so he's like I don't remember you know I was probably gone by then um but I it was it was really great to know that from the get-go with Christy that she also came from that same place of understanding and her and they have three children um and kind of being able to give back in the same way that perhaps it was given to them um while her husband was serving you all have seen then you know, I mean maybe not you personally because you know your dad was serving the reserves but the owner, Dr. Davies of Elevate Health, has, as a military wife, has seen maybe not speech-related, you know, issues, but also, you know, the, the costs for a military family to support that spouse while they're serving. When you started with Elevate Health, then you get integrated into the system and you see this, what did it do to you professionally to realize that you had somebody who really did care about our active duty and veterans? It was it was reassuring um, because I again, I thought I would stay at the VA forever. And it's one thing to feel like you're doing a good job, but it's another thing to feel like you're also giving back to your country and those who sacrifice so much. Um, and then to to go into the civilian world then and be kind of not not adrift, but wanting to find that same purpose. It's, it's another level, in my opinion, um, and I was just so grateful to find that with Dr. Davies and Elevate. So, so I'm, a, I'm a parent or spouse, and one of my family members or myself has a, a, a speech pathology problem, some kind of other issue occupational-wise, and I see that, or here on this show, yay, yay, that you all are in the New Jersey area and you offer these kind of services and I want to see what you all can do to help me. What's the process for a prospective patient to come into Elevate Health and receive treatment? That's a great question. So on our website, elevatehealthnj.com, there's a contact us and it shows the patient intake form. So you could just send it off right there, an online form or it has our phone number for the overall Elevate, and we actually have two locations. One is in East Hampton, um, and one is in Mount Laurel. So pretty achievable if you're coming from um, McGuire, Fort Dix area. Um, but we also do telehealth services if that is preferred or needed, um, depending on if it's appropriate. So by going to our website, giving us a call, that's the easy way to Get, our, get your information in so we can set up an evaluation and move on from there. I'll have the phone number and your website and Oscar Mike radio show post. You can call right from there or, you know, get the process going. So I felt the intake form. You all contact me now, and even though I don't think there's any shots in speech pathology, Nicole, hopefully there's not. Correct. <laughs> oh. Okay. But, but, I'm not really a big wild fan of doctors. Like I don't really like say, you know what? I want to go to the doctor today. No, I don't do that. So 
I, I come into your office. I'm a little apprehensive. And, you know, the first thing you guys do is hand me this clipboard with all this stuff to fill out. You know, what's, what am I doing when I'm going through there? What, what, what should I be thinking as I'm coming into your office for the first time and, and seeing you all? So I would just, you know, come in with an open mind. It hopefully won't be like your average doctor's appointment. Usually it's a lot more, um, I don't want to say fun, but it's definitely more interactive. Um, yeah. we're, we're not really, uh, you know, we're medical, but it's a lot more person to person based. So there's going to be a lot of conversation. We listen as much as, you know, speech pathology is about communication. As much as we can talk, we can also listen pretty well. Um, and we find that sometimes we may get more than we expected and may have to start suggesting, oh, maybe you need to see, you know, a different a additional provider in addition to speech. This may be more than just a speech um, issue you have going on. But so, so help me out with that real, real quick. Mm -hmm. That That's really interesting because there, I didn't think about this. You have to listen to what a patient is saying. So how do you develop that listening skill to be able to say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing what they articulate as the problem, right? But in my practice, in my experience and training, there's actually other issues I want to explore. How, how does that work, Nicole? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it definitely is a, you know, sometimes a personality trait coming in, a lot of people pursue speech pathology because they have this desire to help others. They may have very good empathy and listening skills from the get-go, um, or it's honed throughout. You know, we had four years of undergrad, two years of grad school, a year of a clinical fellowship um, before we're practitioners. Um, so in that time, you're not only learning how to build that rapport with patients, with clients, but also hearing similar stories over and over, you start to see patterns, right? And we give everyone an individualized approach. But for example, working at the VA for me, you hear certain things and you think, well, yes, what you're telling me is manifesting as a speech disorder or stuttering or a thinking problem. But from what I hear from your history, the medications you're on, all these different things, this is where we are medical providers. So I know from research, from experience, that that actually may be caused by something else and we may want to dive down that avenue. We may need a different type of provider in order to address the root cause of the issue. So we're seeing what you're presenting as as your as your reported complaint as the problem, but we're also trying to get to what is the root of that problem. Is it something that we are the professional to fix, or is it something that should be addressed by a different professional? So it's not just come in and here's a, a script or a checklist. You actually have to take time to get to know the patient, understand their complete health picture is what it Absolutely. sounds like. Yeah, and that's what I train. Um, I work with graduate students and clinical fellows, so that's what I, I train them to listen for as well, right? We're not just a one-size-fits-all approach. I've had people come back to me for recurring issues, and clearly what we did the first time didn't address the root cause of it. So now we're really diving even deeper um, into, for example, this is a woman with a voice disorder, and we quote-unquote fixed the issue the first time, but now it's back, so there must be something else going on that we have to dive a little bit deeper. So this is something that really comes from the trust that's built between the speech pathologist or the provider with the patient and the patient, you know, buying in and trusting us, too, that we're there to, to help them. Right. You know, it's again, it's not a checkbox doctor visit. This is a you really tell me what's going on and I'm going to be as open and honest as I can to try and figure out what's the best way to help. Listening to you, it underscores to me the magnitude that no patient is the same for you. Absolutely. And, 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 you know, because the human body is different, I mean, the, the, the challenges must be, you know, different for everybody to say. Yeah. The and if, yeah, if I'm working with four children, maybe they're all age three with autism, they're all four different children with autism. And I'm, I'm, approaching each child individually in what they need to be successful, to have spontaneous, flexible communication, to feel comfortable in their environment. Same thing for if I have four different individuals who have had right-sided strokes, that's going to be four different presentations depending on their life experience, other concomitant um, medical diagnoses, family support, 
all these different factors play a role. So what you learn in school as the textbook, this is what this disorder is, this is how you treat it, really gets flexed when you're treating in the real world. You have these military families come in. And so I'm, I'm, I want to understand how, because as a parent, if I take my child to a care provider, I kind of want to stay with that care provider. And I'm going through the, the treatment process. I'm, I'm doing my part as a parent for the child and interfacing with you all to make sure we're on track. Or if we have to change things, fine. I get, the, I get, I get all that. But, but what happens when it's like, hey, I got to call you, Nicole, and say, hey, you know, I got orders to Okinawa for a year, and we're going to be not only in a different time zone, we're, we're like 13 hours ahead of you, and I'm not going to be able to see you all for a year at least, and my child really is in a good place right now. How do you meet that challenge? Yeah, that's a really, really good question and something that doesn't have a good answer, right? You know, the ideal situation would be that we continue to be that provider regardless of the situation, but we, as speech pathologists, our license does not allow us to treat internationally and sometimes not even across state borders. Um, So it really depends then on knowing where, you know, where you're stationed in Okinawa. There are generally speech pathologists or other providers that are going to be through the military, through the base available for that child. And we can, with the parent's permission, communicate with that provider, provide all of the documentation, talk about it. I have had students who have gone to maybe a new school district and their school speech pathologist reaches out to me and we make sure that we're on the same page so that the student or the child is getting the most consistent plan of care, the parents involved with all of us to make sure that there's a good transition and they're not just kind of thrown to the wolves and said, well, go figure it out. So the most that we can do is what we try to do, which is continue that plan of care by communicating with who the next provider is going to be. I must confess that that, that, that's never made a lot of sense to me. And and, and again, you know, air wing Marine, but walk through with me on this one. I, I get a broken arm or broken leg, right? And I'm in New Jersey one day. And you're, you patched me up, Nicole, you got me, you got me working again. And I go down to Philadelphia for, you know, six months. You can't take care of me anymore because you're not licensed in Philadelphia. I got to get a whole nother set of care providers that, that, that just blows. It doesn't make any sense to me, Nicole. I don't understand. It's really frustrating. And even so, even working in the VA, I could work across state boundaries, but we still couldn't work internationally. So we were still kind of SOL if someone went abroad and wasn't on a base or anything like that. I know. I don't know who's making the rules, but if, if there's something we can do well, about it. It's just, you know, if, if I got a call for my, my, my credit card, you know, help, you, you know, Amex has some place in the Philippines that's looking at my, and that's no problem. But telling me to put, you know, uh, ointment on my, you know, itchy scratchy. No, you can't do that. I'm just saying, you know, I, right. Yeah. If I got a little poison ivy, no, I can't help you. I'm like, yeah. I don't get I poison know. ivy. <laughs> Let's not get poison ivy. So, well, it, it's just, it's just one of those things. And I don't think unless you're tuned to working with military families that you even think about it. You know, I, I've got some of my buddies who, you know, they're, they're 40, 50 years old and the doctor might be 75 years old, but they have gone to the same doctor, even in college, all their lives. So it, it's just something that I don't think people understand about how the military family has to deal with the stress of not only uprooting and moving, but getting their child healthy. It, it, it's got to be hard. Absolutely. And, and in a supportive role you know, say that they do move to Okinawa, I can still email just to be supportive, right? I just can't do treatment. And that's wow. the that's the hard part. So I'm, I'm, I go to the website and I'll have the website link and the phone number on the Oscar Mike Radio Show post. No excuse not to call or look them up. We get the patient, you know, through the intake process, you evaluate the patient. 
the patients on a treatment plan, you've already spoken to that sometimes it doesn't work. And I really appreciate how honest you were about that because, you know, I get frustrated sometimes. I'm like, what do you mean? I came to you and it's still not working. Like, what is going on? You were honest about that. But take off the professional veneer for a second and tell me personally, you've seen this person come in, whether they're military or civilian, and, and you can see them starting to come out of whatever they're in and be able to function better. What's that do for you, Nicole? It makes me continue to believe in how resilient not only the human body is and the human mind, um, but that there's something to be said with the connection that you make with somebody else to have communication and just feel comfortable enough to, even if you're making some mistakes still, to try. And honestly, that's most of the battle with speech pathology is when you're an adult specifically and you might have gone through something is still trying and knowing that some people out there are going to be judgmental and mean and petty and small but you are more resilient than that and you're able to still show how important it is to get your voice across your intent what you're trying to say that's still meaningful it still matters and to me seeing a patient believe that believe in themselves makes me believe it all works, makes me actually believe, you know, what I'm doing may in some small part be helping, but really it's all the patient taking it in and doing it themselves. It's really powerful. I've never really heard it described like that. It, it, it's it's got to be something too. I mean, I, I, I don't want to assume, but you, you see that patient doing well in life later down the road, or if they, you know, get back in touch with you, it, it's got to make it all worth it. Absolutely. So you're not just a, you know, veteran, you know, care provider for the VA. You didn't just come back to New Jersey. You also do some other things, Nicole. I, I <laughs> I'm just couldn't multifaceted. Believe... Yeah, you are multifaceted. Well, well I mean, I, 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 kind of like you, you want to take care of the whole patient. I like to get the whole person. It just makes it better. So when you're not taking someone through this recovery journey, you are actually like truly musically talented. Like go into that for me, please. Because I was like, wait a minute. And then, okay, that, that's first. Then we'll get to the second. Thing. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, all through elementary, middle, high school, I played oboe, saxophone. Um, I joined the drum line because my ex-boyfriend told me I couldn't. So, you know, that's nothing like spite to keep you going. Um, and then, I actually, I did professional drum corps, uh, which is traveling around the country performing um, for many years. I did that. I also taught that um, based out of San Antonio. And then through that, the connections I made and the friendships and networking, I was able to join the Eagles drum line. So for the Philadelphia Eagles. So uh, I've been with them. I was with them from 2011 to 2015. And then I was in Texas for eight years, but now I'm back. So I, I go. To the games i go to do gigs when they get hired out and it's a lot of fun there, there's no kind of like you know betrayal aspect a jersey woman going to a phillies game a, a eagles game what what are you talking about south jersey is all eagles baby really oh yeah no 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 this is eagles you no know, giants no jets country. fans down there absolutely not they're not allowed wait a minute wait a minute you're the one who threw the snowballs at santa Probably. Uh, I was at that snowball game. We played in the snow. It, I have pictures of me covered in snow on the field. Yeah. Is there any correlation between what you've done in music and your, 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 your care protocol or not protocol, your, how your care experience, excuse me. Yeah. I, I would say a lot because um, when I was teaching, I was very young. I was like 19 teaching high schoolers. Um, barely out of high school myself. And from there, learning how to actually be a good teacher, a good listener. Um, I take a lot of that into how I teach with speech pathology. You know, you don't think about it as teaching, it's more treating, but for the most part, I'm teaching somebody how to use their voice again or use their brain in a different, different way, learn to use these communication devices. So there is a lot of teaching and coaching, which I think comes strongly from me from my experience teaching others how to do something totally weird, which is play symbols. 
How is that weird? You need symbols. You need symbols, but to learn how to do it, it's not as easy as you think. Wait a minute. It's not just banging them together like? Oh, no. There's a whole technique. <laughs> There's a lot of technique. Okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe folks will come back on and like show me that technique. We'll see. <laughs> Got some downstairs. Well, I mean, these kinds of conversations, Nicole, really you know fuel me because I hear so many times that no one in the civilian world cares about military families or veterans. I hear that you know sometimes doctors get a bad rap for you know they got it wrong and they all stink and suck or whatever, and you never hear about it from the other side where you're trying to provide that care and the aspect of trust and believing in you know what you're doing and I really felt it interesting how you know you listen to the patient and see other problems that they can't see because they're focused on the on the on the one one problem so it's just extremely beneficial I think for people to hear these stories and I really like the aspect too where this is coming from the owner to the practitioner to make sure military families are welcome in your place of business I mean if 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 I ever come down to South Jersey, I'll stop by Elevate Health and say hello. But uh, thank you for uh, serving our community. Please do. Thank you very much. Thank you for your service. Thank you for being a great American. <laughs> you well, too. It's the, it's the truth. It's the truth. Well, kind of like Exceptional Parent Magazine, the Family Flex Study from Columbia that I, I've done in the past, Lost Mike Radio. I just want people to know that there are organizations like Elevate Health that are open for business to serve not only people, but also understand the unique challenges military families face. Um, you know, Nicole, I guess closing this out, what's next for you and Elevate Health as you, you know, work on, you know, expanding care and being the best you guys can be? Yeah, I really want to be known in the area um, as being a supportive military provider for active service members and for their families. Um, I've had active service members come in the door not knowing what this was going to look like and leaving very pleased with the results. Um, and again, that's for voice, swallowing, stuttering, all the things that nobody realizes can be a problem until it becomes a problem. Um, so that's really what I see moving forward is just continuing to expand that, continue to get the word out that we're here and we have the expertise, um, we have the, the empathy, we want to help. Well, you guys are there, you guys, gals, ladies are there for us to receive this help. You know, I just want to thank you for coming on and sharing with me and, and teaching me about this other side of the coin when it comes to medical care and, you know, understanding too, that it comes from a place of authenticity. I just appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Travis, and letting me kind of use this as a platform to talk more about speech pathology as a whole and, and with Elevate specifically. Absolutely, folks. Well, again, I will have the website link and the phone number in the Oscar Mike Radio show post. So if you need help, reach out. I want to say again, Nicole, thank you to you and your team and uh, Dr. Davies for uh, what you all do. And as we say in Oscar Mike Radio, we are mission in flight. Thank you. Remember, on a teach is our mission. We care about it. We do it every day. But I think there are things that just hit you and give you a reason to go on. The theme for our 2024 from Roots Across America is Live With Purpose. It just seemed to fit in with the vows of the wreath, the 10 attributes that we feel represent our United States military. And I thought, what a great opportunity to put those two things together and show our kids through how we act some of the things that can make their lives better, their communities better, and by doing that, the country better. For me, Live With Purpose, I think, is a, it's a mindset. Set some guidelines and then go out and purposefully make life different, make a change. It's an opportunity to set an example. Thank you for listening and watching Oscar Mike Radio, where our active duty service members and veterans are in action and the mission is in Light. Oscar Mike Radio is an oversized load, co-sinister one production. 
If you are a veteran or know a veteran who needs help, please dial 988 and press 1 for the Veterans Crisis Line.